All right, welcome everybody to OT with DA. Welcome to those of you, welcome to those of you that have signed on a few minutes early on Instagram. We've already been going on Instagram, so for those of you on YouTube, uh, welcome. Hope you had a great day today. Happy Monday. All right, let's see. Lots of people still signing on. I, w I signed on a little early tonight. That wasn't originally my plan, but uh, I was ready to go 10 minutes early, and so I signed on, and we talked about, what do we talk about? Jalapenos and rock climbing and a few other things. For the people that are asking about the rock climb that I was working on, the answer is yes, I made some progress, some so had some incremental progress, but on project climbs like this, they can sometimes take days or weeks or even months. And in, in order to do them successfully from the bottom to the top without falling, that's what rock climbers call a red point. That's the nomenclature that we use. A red point means you've climbed the climb, you've ascended the climb successfully with no falls. And uh, this climb or these two climbs that I'm working on right now are very difficult for me. They're at the top end of the grade that I can presently climb. And so I made some incremental progress, but uh, probably still a little ways off from both of the climbs. But still, it was what I like to call a money in the bank day. Um, pulled really hard on some small holds, got tired, um, learned some new moves, some body positions, and basically absolutely destroyed myself physically. So it's a money in the bank day. Uh, those are the kinds of days that you're really sore the next day. That's today. So I'm totally exhausted, sore. My arms are like very tight, very sore, but tomorrow and the next day and the next day, I'll be stronger and fitter and better. And so anyway, that's how the climb went. Welcome everybody. So glad you're here. We are in chapter 30 five tonight. We're we're chapter 35. Now, tomorrow's going to be 36. And then if I'm not mistaken, the next day will be a double and we'll do 37, 38. But let me just confirm that. Am I giving you correct information here? Yeah, that's right. So we'll do tonight is approaching doom. Tomorrow, the last king of Judah. And then we will do chapters 37 and 38 as a double. And the reason that we have to do that is, again, to stay on pace for my trip to Australia, but also because Elise comes in and she will be with us for chapters 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, maybe even 44. She's going to be with us for most, if not all, of the section on Daniel, which is titled In the Lands of the Heathen. So over the next three days, we'll be finishing up section four, which is National Retribution. And tonight we're in the chapter Approaching Doom. Welcome, everybody. So glad you are here. Hmm. I want to say right up front that I am absolutely, I'm giddy, I'm excited, I'm thrilled about my word. And uh, as you know, that doesn't always happen. I, I tend to be always satisfied with my word, but sometimes I'm just really thrilled about it. Like my last word for the chapter that we did the last time we were together, uh, that was the one on Jeremiah the book of the law and Jeremiah. I, I loved my word there. You might remember my word in the Jeremiah chapter was against. And I thought it was the perfect word, at least for me and my reading of it. I think tonight's word, dare I say, is similarly good, similarly perfect for my reading. I'm so excited. And, and I'm going to be tempted to, uh, Deb says, how many points do you have tonight? 10 points? Actually, when it comes to my word, I have only three. Three points. That's it. Three points. And so let's get started with tonight. It's going to be a good one. It's also one that I told Violetta, and I, I've learned I need to be careful about making this promise. I told her tonight it would be around an hour, okay, because she's got some things she would like for me to do tonight still. And I've had a great day today. I won't go into all the details of my day because I want to really get stuck into tonight's chapter, Approaching Doom. Um but I'm I'm going to be tempted to move a little fast because number one, I told Violetta I would only be about an hour. And number two, because I honestly want to get to my word. <laughs> I'm so enthusiastic about my word for this chapter. And I'm going to be, I'm going to be super excited to see if anybody else picked up on what I picked up on in this chapter, because I literally read this chapter through four times and it wasn't until the fourth time. In fact, I was already decided on another word. But I've learned not to write my word down until I'm completely settled. So I had my word. I'll tell you what that is too later. But then in the fourth reading through, I was like, oh, oh, of course. 
So anyway, we'll get to that in due time. Chapter 35, let's start with prayer. Welcome, everybody. So glad you are here. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, bless us now as we turn our attention to the closing scenes, the closing years in the nation of Judah, the independence of Judah. Um, Father, there are so many lessons here in the various messages and parables that Jeremiah gave to Judah and to the leadership of Judah and to the king. Uh, So, Father, help us to learn what we can learn, to glean what we can glean. Father, we're living in a different time, in a different situation, but in many ways, of course, the principles and the lessons are totally applicable to 2024. So, Father, be with us now as we open this chapter. May you open our hearts, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. And Father, forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for our sins. We have fallen short of the glory of God, and we need your forgiveness and your pity and your mercy. Okay, you guys ready for this? You ready to go? Got my uh, fancy-dancy bird water bottle. You know I love this thing. I just got it, and I love it. Okay, here we go. Chapter 1, or what about chapter 35, page 1, paragraph 1, page 406 of Types and Symbols. It says, and most of this chapter, by the way, is basically the various messages several of the messages from the book of Jeremiah to Judah and to the leadership of Judah, especially King Jehoiakim. And I actually sort of outlined the chapter. Here's what I wrote down. The outline of the chapter is we are first introduced to the chapter and to Jehoiakim. Then there is a series of messages slash parables that Jeremiah tells to Judah and to the leadership of Judah and to the king of Judah. And they are in order. Number one, the Rechabites, the example of the Rechabites. Number two, um, we're told about the various messages that Jeremiah would take when he would travel around the whole of Judah. Number three, uh, the message to Jehoiakim regarding his house. Jehoiakim was building this fancy house right at a time where the prophet Jeremiah was prophesying and promising on God's word, destruction. Number four, the cup of Yahweh's wrath was another illustration like the one with the Rechabites. There are several parables in the prophet, in the book of Jeremiah, and several, at least one that I'm aware of that wasn't even in the chapter today. Um, Then number five, the smashed clay jar. That's, uh, I should have been saying the chapters all along, but that's chapter 19 of Jeremiah. Then in our chapter, Jeremiah goes into prison, which leads to the sort of sixth and final message, and that's the letter that Jeremiah writes via Baruch, the scribe, to Judah, its leaders, and to King Jehoiakim. And then finally, it closes with the death The death of Jehoiakim. We're introduced to Jehoiachin, and who reigns for a very short time, like three months, and then that's the end of the chapter. So it's basically, in many ways, a, a continuation of our last chapter, chapter 34, Jeremiah, but this is more specifically, these are the messages the ones that I just outlined there, and they're largely to, at least in the way that this chapter is set up, uh, to Jehoiakim. Okay, so let's do a little bit of reading here. We're in paragraph one, page 406 of Types and Symbols, looks like 422 of the original. It says, the first year of Jehoiakim's reign, the first years of Jehoiakim's reign, were filled with warnings of approaching doom. And there's our chapter title. The word of the Lord spoken by the prophets was to be fulfi- about to be fulfilled. The Assyrian power to the north, northward, long supreme, was no longer to rule the nations. Interesting. Egypt on the south, in whose power the king of Judah was vainly placing his trust, was soon to be, was soon to receive a decided check. All unexpectedly, a new world power, the Babylonian Empire, was rising to the eastward and swiftly overshadowing all other nations. Okay, so we're introduced to the time, the setting, the historical context. Um, Assyria is not going, Assyria is the nation that was responsible for the the dispersion and the scattering of uh, Israel, of course. This is about a century before. Now it won't be Assyria, though Assyria was the nation that was largely feared. Uh, To almost everyone's astonishment, Babylon has risen very rapidly to the position of preeminence in the ancient world. And so now Babylon is the power from the north and the east, out of the northeast, and they will be coming as an instrument, which is an important word that occurs at least two, maybe three times in this chapter. Next paragraph, within a few short years. Oh, here it is right here. The king of Babylon was to be used as the instrument 
of God's wrath upon impenitent Judah. Again and again, Jerusalem was to be invested and entered by the besieging armies of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Nebuchadnezzar is a the name of a king that we will become very familiar with in our next section, the section on Daniel. And for those of you that are familiar with the book of Daniel, the prophecies of Daniel, the stories of Daniel, that's a name that you will have heard before, Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, the besieging armies of Nebuchadnezzar, company after company, at first, a few only, but later on thousands and tens of thousands were to be taken captive to the land of Shinar, there to dwell in enforced exile. Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, Zedekiah, all these Jewish kings were in turn to become vassals of the Babylonian ruler, and all in turn were to rebel. Severer and yet more severe chastisements would, were to be inflicted upon the rebellious nation until at last the entire land was to become a desolation. Jerusalem was to be laid waste and burned with fire. The temple that Solomon had built was to be destroyed and the kingdom of Judah was to fall, never again to occupy its former position among the nations of the earth. Okay, this second paragraph again is table setting. It's context setting. And we're basically being told, as the chapter title suggests, that all of this prophetic warning and anticipation of what would happen if Judah remained as Israel to the north, impenitent and rebellious, this is what's going to happen. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. Remember the prophet Habakkuk, where he looks out and he says, all I see is violence. All I see is trouble. All I see is desolation. And then God says, you ain't seen nothing yet. Where did the Babylonians come? And so that's what this chapter is all about. The approaching doom of the Babylonian conquest, the Babylonian invasions, the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, and then finally the carrying away of many thousands of the occupants of Judah to Babylon. Let's read the next paragraph. Those times of change so fraught with peril to the Israelitish nation were marked with many messages from heaven through Jeremiah. And that's what the whole chapter is about. That line right there, many messages from heaven through Jeremiah is everything that follows after that are those messages. The Rechabites, the traveling messages, the message to Jehoiakim regarding his house, house excuse me, the cup of Yahweh's wrath, the smashed clay jar, the, the letter that was written, the scroll that was written. That's the rest of the outline of the chapter. So that sentence really sets up the whole chapter, marked with many messages from heaven through Jeremiah. Thus the Lord gave the children of Israel ample opportunity of freeing themselves from entangling alliances with Egypt and of avoiding controversy with the rulers of Babylon. As the threatened danger came closer, there it is again, approaching doom, he taught the people by means of a series of acted parables, hoping thus to arouse them to a sense of their obligation to God and also to encourage them to maintain friendly relations with the Babylonian government. Okay, so what's happening here is that now that Babylon is coming earlier Assyria, but now Babylon from the north and the east, the idea is, oh, well, we know what to do here. We'll just make an alliance. We'll form a, a, a friendship and alliance with Egypt to the south, and they will be our protectors. But as we've already learned, Babylon is also heading to the south. And so Egypt is not going to be any particular help and Judah is going to be left alone. Um, eventually, after the first of the Babylonian incursions under Nebuchadnezzar, these various kings, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah, would be turned into vassals. That means basically puppet rulers that would reign in the place of or in the stead of Babylon. Okay, so, so that's where this is all going. And it's where the prophets have been saying it was going for some time now. And it's not like they didn't know. It's not like they didn't have the example of what happened to Israel under Assyria to the north, right? So they knew that God meant business and they knew that, that the, the importance of Israel as a nation and the descendants of Abraham as a, an evangelistic enterprise was not such that God would not allow them to suffer punishment and judgment. Now, as we've already discussed, some would have thought, no, 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 that's fine for Israel up in the north, but not for us because we have the temple. Remember? The temple, the temple, the temple. And they had begun to relate to the temple in quasi-pagan fashion, thinking that the building itself was the thing rather than it being a symbol that pointed to the capital T thing, which was Yahweh and to his providing of supreme sacrifice. But that paganism now, paganism in the mind, has now eclipsed their correct thinking that had been revealed in Torah. And so the building itself, they imagine, many of them, that this is like an insulative factor that will not allow us to be fully taken captive. They can't imagine. And yet that's exactly what's going to take place. 
Okay, um, let's see here. Then she gets into the story of the Rechabites, right? And that's the first of the many uh, sort of lessons here that Jeremiah brings to Judah and to its leadership. Let's just read a little bit of that. To illustrate the importance of yielding implicit obedience to the requirement of God, Jeremiah gathered some Rechabites into one of the chambers of the temple and set wine before them, inviting them to drink. As was to have been expected, he met with remonstrance and absolute refusal. We will drink no wine, the Rechabites firmly declared. For Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, saying, You shall drink no wine, you nor your sons forever. Then came the word of the Lord to Jeremiah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Go and tell the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Will you not receive instruction to obey my words, says Yahweh? The words of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, which he commanded his sons not to drink wine, they're performed. For to this day they drink none and obey their father's commandment. This is all from Jeremiah chapter 35. You can go read the amazing account of the Rechabites that said, no, we're not going to do that. We are going to obey the sort of family cultural tradition that's been handed down to us by our patriarch, right? Jonadab, the son of Rechab. And so they actually came to be known as the Rechabites. And, and God uses this as an illustration to say, hey, look at the implicit obedience. They're unbending, they're immovable. There's just certain things they won't do. And, and just by way of you know autobiographical illustration here, I have been somebody that doesn't drink alcohol for a very, very, very long time. Um, I became, this might not mean anything to those of you that are tuning in, but some of you might've heard of the term straight edge before. So I was like a punk rock kid, punk rock skateboard kid. I was in bands and we would go on tours and touring bands would come to our town. And I just loved the punk rock music. I loved the punk rock scene and the skateboarding scene. There was a lot of overlap between punk rock and skateboarding. Well, there are a number of different sort of branches or types or genres of punk rock. And one of them is called straight edge. And I was a straight edge punk rock kid. And from a young age, from the age of about 17, I became a punk rock kid. And the straight edge kids, we would wear big X's on our hands. Some people would even get X's tattooed on their hands or tattooed on them. I never did that. I did get other tattoos, but I didn't get the X's. And the idea was that we would not smoke. We wouldn't drink. We wouldn't do any drugs. It's what it meant to be straight edge. This is actually written about in, in the book that Jennifer Schwerzer wrote about myself and my good friend, Nathan Renner called Twice Upon a Time. So if you have access to that book, you can read it. I'm, I don't think it's available on Kindle, but it's coming out on audiobook. So if you haven't read that book yet, Twice Upon a Time, um, you, I think you'll really enjoy it. It's basically just the story of my life, my early life, and then Nathan Renner's early life and how similar our lives were. And one of the things that I was, was a straight edge punk rocker. And in the book, Jennifer talks about straight edge. And the, the term straight edge actually comes from an old punk rock band that was started by a guy named Ian McKay. And the band was Minor Threat. And Minor Threat had a song called Straight Edge. And it was, I don't smoke, I don't have sex, I don't drink, at least I can think. And that then sort of launched this movement of young punk rock kids. Many of us then became vegetarians. Many of us became vegans. So from an early age, I had decided that I would not drink alcohol. I would not do drugs. And I became a vegetarian at a young age. Not for health reasons, but for animal rights reasons. And uh, sort of you know, larger environmental reasons. So, so anyway, the point is, is that was a decision that I made. Like I made this decision. It was a conviction that I had, a passionate, immovable conviction that I had. And I have stuck to that conviction now. I'm in my, you know, early fifties. I was just visiting with one of my rock climbing friends recently. I might've already told this story, but my friend Alex, he was like telling me that he's doing dry January, which is a thing where people don't drink during the month of January. And uh, he said, yeah, I'm doing dry January. And then he said, I think I'm going to do dry February as well, because he finds that he climbs better and he loses weight when he's not drinking alcohol. And I said to him, I'm doing dry life. <laughs> I said, I I'm doing dry life. And he said, what, what do you mean? And I said, I don't drink alcohol. I haven't drank alcohol since I was like 15 years old. You know, I, I drank alcohol in my house and got drunk and it was a nightmare. And it was like the only time in my whole life I ever got drunk. One time by myself in my parents' house with my father's liquor cabinet, and I got so sick. I got, I got so sick. I felt like I was going to die. And I, about halfway through it, I wished I would have died. And that cleansed me of any interest in alcohol. That was it. One and done. 
And uh, so when I told Alex this, he was just laughing. He thought it was funny. He said, he's doing dry January, maybe dry February. I'm doing dry life. Okay, so the Rechabites are the same. The Rechabites are like, no, we're going to insulate ourselves from any potential worries with or about drunkenness, inebriation, addiction. We're just not going to drink any fruit of the vine because our patriarch told us not to. Incidentally, one of the things I've told my two sons over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, when they were young, I used to walk them through the liquor aisles of grocery stores. And I would say, not all the time, but occasionally we'd walk through a liquor aisle and I'd say, boys, do you see all of this? They were young. And they would say, yeah, what is all this? You see all these bottles? Do you see all these cans? And they'd say, yeah, yeah, what, what is it, dad? And I'd say, it's all poison. And they'd be, you know, what? I say, I, you're not going to believe this. All of this is poison and they sell it here. They sell poison. And my kids were just like totally mortified. You might say, well, you were, you were like brainwashing them. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I wanted them to be completely insulated from ever needing to taste alcohol and, um, or wanting to. And I used to say to them over and over again, boys, you know, the number one way, the number one way to never take a second drink of alcohol is to never take a first. And to this day, I'm happy to report that both of my boys would tell you loudly and proudly, 22 and 21, they've never had a drink of alcohol and they don't want to, and I hope they never do. I hope that if anyone ever brings them somewhere and sets alcohol in front of them and says, drink this alcohol, they'll say, no, our, our father, David, the son of Richard, said to never drink this alcohol. <laughs> They're just not going to do it. Because I, I'm really invested in the idea that the world would be an infinitely better place without alcohol. I mean, just imagine how much better the world would be if there was no alcohol or if alcohol didn't have the effect that it has on the sort of human system, physiologically and neurologically. The, the world would be an infinitely better place. I mean, I have two friends that were killed by a drunk driver, right? And I used to take care of people with fetal alcohol syndrome. You can just imagine how much less crime, how much less abortion, how much less unwanted pregnancy, how much less drunk driving accidents, how much less addiction, how much less pain, the world would be an immeasurably better place without alcohol. So in my view, there is just no good reason to ever drink alcohol. And I educated my boys that way. So I can totally relate to the experience here of the Rechabites when the, when the wine is placed in front of them and they say, you know, you drink. And they said, no, under no circumstances. And there needs to be those things that we are just immovable on. Things that we just say, no, I'm not doing that. That's not who I am. That's not what I do. Okay, I, I, I do not do that. I'm not that kind of a person. Now, we don't believe, just to be clear, that our moral clarity and moral convictions about things are the way that we become, uh, that we receive eternal life or become followers of Jesus. No, we, be, we receive eternal life and become followers of Jesus through the righteousness of Christ and through faith in that righteousness. Okay, yes and yes and yes. But still, I love the idea that there should just be things. We should say, hey, I'm a Christian. I'm a disciple of Jesus. There's just stuff I don't do. I just don't. That's not how I live. That's not the way I live. And of course, this is all in Christ's strength, and a lot more could be said about that. Uh, my good friend John Ashton wrote a book on the dangers of alcohol, and uh, it's an excellent book. Highly recommend. In fact, I've got it right here. What's it called? It's called... Uncorked, The Hidden Dangers of Alcohol by John Ashton. Not that you need to read a book on the hidden dangers of alcohol because we are surrounded by manifold evidences of the danger and downsides of alcohol. Okay, so anyway, back to our sort of chapter here. They're brought in and then this is used as one of the illustrations to say, look at the implicit obedience here. Where's my obedience? Right? And she actually says here, let's go to... Um, there's a section here, go to page 409, 409, skipping over a page. Uh, there's a paragraph toward the top that says, the lesson is for us, begins that way. The lesson of the Rechabites is for us. She continues, if the requirements of a good and wise father who took the best and most effectual means to secure his posterity against the evils of intemperance were worthy of strict obedience, surely God's authority should be held in as much greater reverence as he is holier than man. Our creator and our commander, infinite in power, terrible in judgment, seeks by every means to bring men 
to see and repent of their sins. By the mouth of his servants, he predicts the dangers of disobedience. That's a really important phrase. The dangers of disobedience. I'll come back to it in just a second. He sounds the note of warning and faithfully reproves sin. His people are kept in prosperity only by his mercy through the vigilant watch care of chosen instrumentalities. He cannot uphold and guard a people who reject his counsel and despise his reproofs. For a time, he may withhold his retributive judgments, yet he cannot always stay his hand. Okay, I want to dwell on two things in this paragraph, an extremely important paragraph. So the first thing is this idea of the dangers of disobedience. Okay, this is very important because I've said this before and I'm going to say it here again. The whole teaching of Scripture is, is that sin is not, is not arbitrarily dangerous. Sin is not arbitrarily bad. In other words, God didn't just decide randomly and without reason or rhyme, I'm just going to say that uh, certain things are bad and uh, certain things are good. No, 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 no. The things that are good are the things that reflect the nature and character and beauty of God. The things that are bad are things that are antithetical to that nature. Those things are called sin, right? Sin is the transgression of the law. What law? God's law of love. Paul says in Romans 14, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So, so sin is bad in and of itself, and sin comes packaged with its own punishment, right? God doesn't have to come in arbitrarily or, you know, from another angle and add a punishment to sin because sin has the punishment built into it. Sin has the judgment built into it. Sin has the death built into it. And that's what she means by that phrase, the dangers of disobedience. Notice, not the dangers of Yahweh, but the dangers of disobedience. We sometimes get it get it mixed up, right? We get it wrong. And we think, oh, I, I don't want to do sin because if I do sin, then God will punish me. Well, that's true in one sense, but in another sense, it's actually not what's happening. What's actually happening is that you're committing the sin and the punishment, the judgment is inbuilt to the sin and God permits you to have the consequences of those choices. In fact, that word permits occurs in the types and symbols just literally back across the page on page 408 it says here, the Lord permits them to be led by other influences. That word permits is a very important word in Ellen White's theology. God permits, God allows, but God, God only allows us at some level to have the consequences of the decisions that we make, whether for good or for ill. Okay, so the dangers of disobedience. Now I want to dwell on that last little bit there. He cannot uphold and guard a people who reject his counsel and despise his reproofs for a time they may with he may withhold his retributive judgments, yet he cannot always stay his hand. Notice she doesn't say here, he will not, but he cannot. Okay, now here again, anytime we see this cannot, we're tempted to think that God's omnipotence or that he is somehow constrained by an external factor, that something is preventing God from doing something. That's not what's happening. When she says here that God cannot uphold and guard a people who reject his counsel, the reason is not that God lacks power, or ability, or omnipotence, it's because God, within the context of the covenantal rules of engagement described in Scripture, where other agents are given genuine will and agency to act in ways that are unique to them, that God honors those actions, God honors those agency, honors that agency, and in the case of Judah, God has been withholding, 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 warning, 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 cautioning, cautioning, cautioning. But at some point, the, the threshold is reached and the, the, the judgment is tipped and God can no longer withhold his restraining hand. Not that he's not capable of withholding it, but within the context of the covenantal rules of engagement that we call the great controversy, he allows people to get what they're persistently asking for. This is a very important idea. God can't just rearrange the cake mix of the great controversy to say that he can do what we don't want him to do because that is to overrule our agency. No, the covenantal rules of engagement, and I know I've recommended this book before, but I want to recommend it again. Where is it? There it is. Okay, so this is a book that if you haven't already read, you really should read. It's called Theodicy of Love, Constructing, or excuse me, Conflict Cosmic, Oh, Cosmic Conflict and the Problem of Evil. Take a screenshot of that. The Odyssey of Love, if you haven't already read it, I'll hold it up to the camera there. The Odyssey of Love. Take a screenshot of that. Okay, so the reason I recommend that book in the context of this conversation is that Dr. Peckham shows the, the biblical 
context and the biblical passages that undergird this notion of covenantal rules of engagement. Okay? So it's not that God cannot in terms of his power and his ability, but that he does not because of the agency, the genuine agency that he has invested others with. Okay, then the next paragraph, let's read that. The children of Judah, this is on page 409 still. The children of Judah were numbered among those whom God had declared, you shall see, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Going all the way back to Sinai, all the way back to that Sinai promise and covenant, Exodus 19, 6, never did Jeremiah in his ministry lose sight of the vital importance of heart holiness in the varied relationships of life, and especially in the service of the Most High God. Plainly, he foresaw the downfall of the kingdom and a scattering of the inhabitants of Judah among the nations. But with the eye of faith, he looked beyond all this to the times of restoration. Okay, I think, if I'm not mistaken, this is the first time now that she has used the word scatter with regards to Judah. We've used the word scatter over and over and over again with regards to Israel, but I think this is the first time where she uses the word scatter with regard to Judah. And you might remember that my word back in chapter 23 the Assyrian captivity, my word for that was scattered. And so here we have the scattering of the inhabitants of Judah. Now, there's a second thing I want to bring out here in the same paragraph, but with the eye of faith, he looked beyond all this to the times of restoration. Ringing in his ears was the divine promise, I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their folds. Behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh, that I will raise up to David, a branch of righteousness, capital B, that's Jesus. This is a, one of the great messianic prophecies in the Old Testament and in the writings of Jeremiah. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness, Jeremiah 23, three to six. One of the great messianic passages in all the Old Testament. Now, you might remember that this idea that, that God would give Jeremiah these long-term visions of restoration, these long-term messianic eschatological visions, just to keep him on track, to keep him encouraged, and to keep him sane. We talked about that back on page 393. Let me just read you that. Uh, this is page 393 of Types and Symbols, 408. Paragraph begins, Yet amid the general, yet amid the general ruin into which the nation was rapidly passing, Jeremiah was often permitted to look beyond the distressing scenes of the present to the glorious prospects of the future when God's people should be ransomed from the land of the enemy and planted again in Zion. Okay, this is very important. And it's, it's really a very important hermeneutical lesson. Hermeneutical means the way that we interpret things. To understand the prophecies of Isaiah and of Jeremiah and even of Daniel and the other prophets, you have to bear in mind that, that God is often, I've used the illustration before, of an accordion. You, you know, an accordion is the instrument that has the keys on one side, and you, my, my father-in-law, Violet, his dad, Zaharia, he's very good at the accordion. He loves, you know, Sabbath evening or one of the evenings, just pulling out the accordion, and he can play a million songs on the accordion. And I love the sound of the accordion. Violet will tell you, if she was in here, she would tell you, anytime I'm walking, usually through the streets of somewhere in Europe, if I'm walking and there is a, a street musician, a busker, playing the accordion, I will always tip him, even if I have to, or her, usually a him, even if I have to go to an ATM and get out money and then walk back to them. I love the sound of the accordion so much, and I love the ambience that the accordion brings so much that I tip, I always tip them under all circumstances. Um, so... I just, if I either give them money. Violetta knows as soon as we're walking around some village or some uh, city in, in Europe, if I hear the accordion sound, she's already reaching for her wallet because she knows I'm going to say, hey, babe, I need some money. And I don't give them coins. I give them real money. And I like to tip other buskers as well, other street musicians. But if you're playing an accordion, you're going to get a very generous tip from me. Now, back to the accordion. So the accordion... What, what's happening very often in these prophetic books, you might call this the accordion hermeneutical principle, is that sometimes the accordion, when it's pushed all the way together, it looks, it's, it's, it's compressed, right? Laterally compressed. And it looks like those events are really close. But, but here's what's actually happening in many of the prophecies of Jeremiah, Isaiah, um, even Moses, but the ver Ezekiel, Daniel, the minor prophets. Okay, here's what's happening. What sometimes is really compressed together because that's the way the prophets 
saw it in vision or it was revealed to them in vision, when the accordion goes out, then we can see, oh, so what the prophet collapses together thematically is sometimes actually centuries or even millennia apart chronologically. Okay, I want to say that again. What the prophets sometimes do is they collapse things thematically, that is to say in terms of the theme, but those events are actually really far apart. So, so you'll have a messianic prophecy like the one that we just had there in Jeremiah 23 that might be right next to a promise of judgment. That's because when the prophets saw things, we don't know exactly how they saw it, but it appears that the way, because many of the prophets record messages like this, thematically, not just chronologically, they appeared to see things almost kind of like a dream, not always, but sometimes, where things were kind of jumbled together. And, and if you've had a dream, you know what this is like. There's, and you recognize, oh yeah, I remember, that was when we were on our trip to Sweden. And oh yeah, I remember, we ate at that restaurant. And it's all just kind of jumbled together. And it appears that in some sense, the way the prophets saw their messages or saw their visions were, were these things that they were themselves then trying to make sense of. And they were just writing out what they saw. That they were just writing it out. What we now know as we look back through the hermeneutical lens and the glasses that, that have been afforded us by the New Testament, by the incarnation of Jesus, is that many of these events that looked really close and collapsed together were actually quite far apart. Okay, and this is a very important principle that, that sometimes you're just like, I don't know exactly when this takes place. Like, when is all this restoration that Isaiah talks about in the latter third of his book? Well, that's all messianic and eschatological, end time. Because what looks really close in Isaiah's telling of the story is actually, you know, is actually spread or expanded away from the immediate events by, again, centuries or even millennia. Very important principle here. And this passage here in Jeremiah 23 is one of the greatest. Okay, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move along here a little bit faster. She does spend a uh, little bit on page 410 talking about how the, the godly in Judah would hear these messianic prophecies of restoration, these eschatological prophecies of, of restoration, and they would be thrilled and they would teach them to their children. And some of those children, like Daniel and his companions, would carry this message of hope, this message of Yahweh, this message of future restoration and of global restoration to, for example, Babylon. And that's exactly what's going to happen with Daniel. Okay, so she spends the page 410 talking about that. And uh, that's pages, looks like 427, 428 of the original. And we're going to talk a lot about Daniel. And we'll have ample time to talk about how God used... He didn't choose Judah's disobedience or Israel's disobedience, but he used their disobedience to disperse, or our word, to scatter Israel and Judah to other places so that the message, the message of the prophets, the message of a coming Messiah could get out. It's really amazing. It's like, you know, he squeezed the ketchup bottle or he squeezed the, the toothpaste so that the message would get out. They weren't getting it out evangelistically. So the message will get out by way of judgment. It's really quite an incredible thing. What they refused, because they became isolationist, and God said, I didn't call you to be isolationist. He squeezed the toothpaste out. Now, you say, wow, that's really kind of rough and sort of, you know, that's tough. And it's like, yeah, exactly. It's That was not God's plan. Remember, we're way down on God's plan. It's not A, B, C, D, E, F, or G. By this time, we're like down in plan, you know, X, Y, Z. But God is still working with what he's got. Okay, then on page 411, she talks about um, Jeremiah's considerable travels, how he traveled all around Judah and brought this message primarily of the law and of the Decalogue and re re referring people back to the temple text, the book of the law that had been discovered in the days of Josiah. Um, he's telling them that a scattering is coming, a desolation is coming. Remember, Josiah asked, you know, what if we all repented? What if we all turned? Is there, could we still avoid the coming Babylonian incursions? And God said, no, through Huldah. God said, no. And so Jeremiah, of course, knows this, and he's telling everybody the same thing. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And you basically have two classes of people. You have deny, people that are denying it. We might call them the denialists, right? And then you have the people that don't want it, but they believe it. They understand that it's coming and they're preparing. Okay, so, so Jeremiah is traveling all around to let people know this is happening, okay? It has been threatened in past generations. 
It is actually happening and the denialists don't want to hear it. And those that are soft in heart and that the spirit, we're responding to the spirit of Yahweh, they're preparing themselves and their children. Um, okay, so then just, I'm going to keep kind of motoring along here. Go over to page 413. This is where I just want to briefly mention that right in the middle of the page, looks like page 431 of the original. This is where in the scroll of Jeremiah, it was mentioned that this captivity would last 70 years. Now that becomes very important for us because that shows up in the book of Daniel. And we'll probably have opportunity to talk about that when we get to the book of Daniel. But that 70 years is important. I'll just read it here. This whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Okay, this will become important for us when we get into the book of Daniel, especially the prophecies of Daniel. Okay, then you get this second, or I guess it's not second, we're just moving through these images. We get the draining cup filled with the wine of God's wrath. That is a motif that will come up later, especially in the book of Revelation right? The, the, the cup of God's wrath, which is poured out full strength, right? You'll be familiar with that language. This is from Jeremiah 25. Then the, the potter's vessel or the, 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 the um, flask that was smashed and just smashed into oblivion. And this is Jeremiah basically saying, look, this thing has been smashed. It's in a million shards. It cannot be put back together. We're past the point of no return. The Babylonians are coming. The city will be destroyed. Thousands and thousands and thousands will lose their lives. This is happening, and it's happening soon. Okay, then Jeremiah is thrown in prison because the leadership doesn't like his message. It's a message that they don't want to hear. It's a me they're denialists. They don't want to receive this message of rebuke and of the promise of these retributive judgments. Again, not arbitrarily from Yahweh, but as the consequences of generational rebellion and idolatry. So I want to read on page 414, the prophet's words. Paragraph begins, the prophet's words. Here we go. The prophet's words, instead of leading to confessions and repentance, aroused the anger of those high in authority. And as a consequence, Jeremiah was deprived of his liberty. Of course, of course. Because if somebody says something we don't like, let's lock them up. Right? Let's lock them up. We talked about this under the reign of Manasseh. Wasn't it under the reign of Manasseh? the tyrannical reign of Manasseh, who silenced all the dissenting voices, the voices of disapproval. That's the telltale sign of a tyrant. Doesn't want to hear any contrary perspectives or opinions. And here, uh, uh, Jehoiakim acts exactly like a tyrant, like Manasseh before him and Ahab and others. When there's a contrary voice, we're going to silence you, kill you, make it so that you can't say your things anymore. But actually, he is going to say what he wants to say, even from prison, we'll get to that in just a second. Imprisoned and placed in the stocks, the prophet nevertheless continued to speak the messages of heaven to those who stood by. His voice could not be silenced by persecution. Amen. The word of truth he declared was, in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back and I couldn't. Jeremiah says, even though I was in prison, even though I was put in stocks, I couldn't shut up because God placed this passion, this fiery burning in my bones that even under the threat of death and of pain, I just couldn't keep quiet. This is a man sold out to God, a man sold out to Yahweh, a man sold out to his mission. He says, I'm, I'm not going to be quiet. The, the words were like a burning fire in my bones. I absolutely love that. I've always loved Jeremiah 29. And he says, even if I wanted to resist it, I couldn't. God has just consumed me with his message of truth and this message of warning. Okay, so then God says to him, okay, if this is how they're going to act, they're going to lock you up, then, then apparently he had access to his um, scribe, Baruch. Baruch comes down and he records this scroll, right? He records this scroll and it's recorded, recorded, recorded. And then he begins, Baruch goes up and reads it first to the people of Jerusalem, or excuse me, Judah. Then he reads it to the princes. The princes hear it and they're like, ah, you need to read this to the king. So now I'm going to go to page 415. Paragraph begins, when King Jehoiakim, when King Jehoiakim was told by the princes that Baruch had read, or what he had read, he immediately ordered the roll brought before him and read in his hearing. One of the royal attendants, Jehudi by name, fetched the roll and began reading the words of reproof and warning. It was the time of winter and the king and his companions of state, the princes of Judah, were gathered about an open fire. 
Only a small portion had been read. I'll come back to that in a second. When the king, far from trembling at the danger hanging over himself and his people, seized the roll and in a frenzy of rage, cut it with the scribe's knife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until the scroll was consumed. Neither the king nor his princes were afraid, nor did they tear their garments. Certain of the princes, however, implored the king not to burn the scroll, but he would not listen to them. The writing having been destroyed, the wrath of the wicked king rose against Jeremiah and Baruch, and he forthwith sent for them to be taken, but Yahweh hid them. Okay, so this is actually really important here because first of all, I want to highlight this idea that only a small portion had been read. Okay, this is a great point. This is a really practical, a point of really practical application. If somebody has made up their mind about something, you can bring the most persuasive arguments and people are not going to listen. A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. I've seen this again and again. Years ago, I had one of my punk rock friends and happily several of my punk rock friends have become followers of Jesus and several of them have even become Seventh-day Adventist pastors and ministers, including my good friend Nathan Renner, who will be with us this time next week. So, but there were other of my punk rock friends who already knew everything. And when I would try to talk to them about the Bible, about Jesus, about scripture, about prophecy, I would just, I, I would just begin to talk. I'd get the word God out or the word Jesus out or the word Bible out or the word prophecy out. And they would immediately shut me down. They, no, no, I don't want to hear anything about that. They just, brruh, they were just closed. And, and that's exactly the attitude here of Jehoiakim. As soon as he hears not a positive message, not a flattering message, not the message of one of his sycophant advisors. He's like, I don't want to hear it. And what's this guy's name? Jehudi, you know, throws it in the fire. There, there are people out there who just don't want to hear the truth. And as soon as you even begin to say the truth, you can say it in the nicest way, in the kindest way, in the most situationally contextual way. You can say it in the most winsome way, in the most winning way. But as soon as you get certain words, certain ideas out of your mouth, shoom, they just shut it down because they don't want to be exposed. And I've seen this again and again. I've seen it in my evangelistic efforts. I've seen it in my witnessing efforts. I've seen it especially early on with my punk rock friends because becoming a Christian in my culture was just anathema. It was the worst thing you could do, the most reprehensible and traitorous thing you could do. So, so I've seen that. And it's a lesson for us here that you can do everything exactly right. Jeremiah dictated the scroll correctly. And Baruch captured it just right. And it everything can be done just right. And still there will be a certain class of people that the moment they hear certain ideas or words or phrases or concepts, nope, I don't want to hear anymore. And you know what? That's not on you. That's not on Jeremiah. That's not on Baruch. And that's not really your responsibility. That is between them and God because they're not really upset at you. Jeremiah, for example, is just a stand in here. Uh, Jeremiah is just a mouthpiece. He's a messenger. The real problem here is not Jeremiah. It's that Jehoiakim and his advisors don't want to hear the truth. So should we try to be savvy and winsome and winning and intelligent and attractive in our presentation of the gospel, of the Bible, of the prophecies, of Jesus, of the gospel? Yes. But there's a class of people that no matter how you say it, no matter how well you say it, no matter how well delivered it is, they're going to tune you out instantly. And that's not about you. Okay? That's not a rejection of you. It's like God said to Samuel, they have not rejected you. They've rejected me. Okay? So I just wanted to point that out because it was just a little bit. It says only a small portion had been read. And there's a really great point of practical application there. I skipped over the part about how um, Jehoiakim was going to build this fancy house, this house of cedar. And one of the lessons here is that Jeremiah says, what are you doing? You're going you're gonna to hide in a house of cedar? Everything's Everything's going to hell in a handbasket. You know, so his message was not only to the people in the rural environs, and he was going right to the source of power. He was speaking truth to power. Okay, now page 416, and we're getting here down toward the end. Top of page 416. The paragraph actually begins just before that, at the very bottom of page 415. In bringing the attention, this is like 433, 434. In bringing the attention of the temple worshipers and of the princes and king, the written ad admonitions contained in the inspired role, God was graciously seeking to warn the men of Judah for their good. That's what you're trying to do when you witness, when you tell somebody about Jesus, when you ask them if they want to come to church, if they want to study the Bible. You're just doing something for their good. Hopefully graciously. It may be, he said, the house of Judah will hear 
all the adversities which I have purposed to bring upon them, that everyone may turn from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. It may be. Perhaps. Let's see what happens. And then I love this line. It's one of my favorite lines, maybe my single favorite line in the whole chapter. God pities men and women struggling in the blindness of perversity. Underline that. I mean, to me, that's one of the best lines. That's, that's all time, actually. That's one of the great, great lines in the whole book so far. God pities men and women struggling in the blindness of perversity. What is God's posture toward Jehoiakim and people like him that want nothing to do with God, nothing to do with the truth, and the moment they hear a certain phrase or word or idea, they just shut it down? How does God relate to them? Out of anger? Out of angst? Out of hatred? Out of vengeance? No. Out of pity and mercy. There's sadness and pity in the heart of God. Underline that line. It's one of the most important lines in the whole chapter. God pities men and women struggling in the blindness of perversity. And how about that phrase? The blindness of perversity. Wow. There's, I, didn't, I didn't actually highlight that. I got to highlight that. The blindness of perversity is such a telling phrase. And I imagine my buddy Stefan would have something to say about that because there, that is like uh, Peterson-esque, right? The blindness of perversity, because uh, you think about the word perversion here, just for a moment. Let's just dwell on this for a moment. The blindness of perversity. A perversion is a deviation from the norm, right? So we often use the word perv or pervert in the context of like sexual deviancy. Okay, so we'll say, oh, he's a sexual pervert or she's a sexual pervert. Not always, but but this idea of perversity, we very often have, has kind of a sexual association or connotation. I'm not saying, I don't think that's what she means here, but I'm just using this to make the illustration. So the idea is, is that there's a straight line. There's a straight line. It should be like this, but a perversion is a departure or a deviation from that line. Okay, now here's what happens though. When we deviate from the straight line, when we deviate from the truth, anytime we deviate or depart from the truth, what we end up with is a kind of blindness because we have convinced ourselves that either A, we know the truth better than we do, B, that we'll be better off living a lie or following a lie or a deception than following the truth. And this is all a kind of willful blindness. And sin is this way. I'm actually really interested in what Stefan has to say here. I want to read it. Facts. I would lull exactly. The pathologizing, oh, hold on. The pathologizing of your vision, the deviation from the correct path, we bring it upon ourselves, yet Yahweh calls us back. He comes after us to bring us to the right. That's exactly right. Yeah, the pathologizing is exactly the right word there. That it's a willful blindness. When we knowingly depart, which I've done. Okay, let's just be honest here. I have done things that I knew I shouldn't have done, and I did them anyway. Why did I do them? Well, because I didn't know better. No, I know too much to say I didn't know any better. No, no, I did them because I convinced myself in my willful blindness that my way was better, that, 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 that this departure was actually preferable to the truth, right? And, and this is the game that we play with ourselves. You know, the, the easiest person to fool is yourself. The game that we play with ourselves is we convince ourselves that at some level, in this situation, under these circumstances, we actually know a little better. And so we make all of these sort of concessions and these, we allow our biblical convictions to die the death of a thousand qualifications when we say, well, under these circumstances, under this situation, I got a little angry. I told a little gossip. I got a little lustful. I spent my money unwisely and we have our qualifications. And... The problem is, is that when, when we do that, we embark on a willful departure, a perversion from what we know is the truth, and that brings about a willful blindness. And that's why we need to be in the Word. We need to be with Jesus. We need community to keep us from falling into our own deceptions and devices. Again, if, if the easiest person to fool is ourself, we need accountability structures around us. Prayer, Bible study, fasting, community. We need structures around us, because if left to our own devices, we will, like a star, we will collapse in on ourselves, implode in on ourselves, and we can't allow that to happen. We know better. 
And when we sin, when we fall, when we fail, what should we do? We should immediately repent. In fact, there's this great line in here where she literally says, where's that line where she says that when we have sinned against God, the best and most noble thing we can do. Where is that? Oh, I've, oh it's, right, it's right there. It's right there. Um, jump down. So we're in the, that line there. Okay, we'll get there in just a second. We'll get there in just a second. God pities men struggling in the blindness of perversity. He seeks to enlighten the darkened understanding huh, by sending reproofs and threatenings designed to cause the most exalted to feel their ignorance and to deplore their errors, right? These are accountability structures. He endeavors, that is to say, he tries to help the self-complacent. Ah, what a fascinating phrase, the self-complacent. These are the lies we tell ourselves. These are the ways we trick ourselves. The self-complacent to become dissatisfied. Wow, this is such a great section. With their vain attainments and to seek for spiritual blessing through a close connection with heaven. Okay, this is all time. I am hereby officially elevating page 416 of types and symbols to the all-time list. And I'm doing this in real time. All-time 416. So I'm going to go to the front here. Use my beautiful little ribbon, go to my all time list, and put page 416. It's too good. It's too good, and it's too applicable, and it's too practical not to have on the all time list. I'm going to read it again. He pities, God pities men struggling in the blindness of perversity. He seeks to enlighten the darkened understanding by sending reproofs and threatenings designed to cause the most exalted to feel their ignorance and to deplore their errors. Ah, see what he's trying. Oh, I want to say so much. What he's trying to do is not come in artificially and force us to see that which we refuse to see. He tries to persuade us. And he persuades us with, number one, his beauty, number two, the truth of the gospel, and number three, the folly of departing from the truth. I love that God respects our agency here such that he tries to persuade, he tries to invite, he tries to woo. And that's what he's trying to do with Judah, with Jehoiakim, and with us. He endeavors to help the self-complacent become, this is such great language, dissatisfied with their vain attainments and to seek for spiritual blessing or spiritual insight through a close connection with heaven. That's just all so good. That's all time. The next paragraph is also excellent. Let's keep reading. God's plan is not to send messengers who will please and flatter sinners. He delivers no messages of peace to lull the unsanctified into, and there's a bunch of C words here that are really good, carnal security. Instead, he lays the heavy burdens upon the conscience of the wrongdoer and pierces his soul with sharp arrows of conviction. Those three words right there are crucial. Carnal, conscious, con conscience, conviction. Carnal, conscience, conviction. And again, notice how he always retaining the viability and the, the sanctity of the agent itself, the person itself, that God is trying to woo, that God is trying to persuade, that God is trying to win, God never, this is back to our covenantal rules of engagement, God never violates the sanctity and the, the veracity of the agent. He's always working through the agent's own reasoning, thinking, their fear of, of pain and of death, right? That's the threatened punishments. God is working through all available means to retain agency and yet woo people to the truth and away from what she calls the blindness of perversity. Ministering angels present to him the fearful judgments of God to deepen the sense of need and to prompt the agonizing cry, what must I do to be saved? Acts 16.30. And I love this. But the hand that humbles to the dust, rebukes sin and puts pride and ambition to shame is the hand that lifts up the penitent stricken one. Ah, oh, ah, oh, oh, so good. Read it again. The hand that humbles to the dust, rebukes sin, puts pride and ambition to shame, is the same hand that lifts up the penitent stricken one. With deepest sympathy, he who permits the chastisement to fall inquires, what do you want me to do for you? Wow, that's also all time. That's also all time. This whole page is all time. Okay, and then this is the part I was talking about earlier. When we've sinned, when we've fallen. Oh, wait, 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 wait. What did you say there? I see you said the word prompt. Did I miss the word prompt? Let me just read it here real quickly. Yes, prompt. Thank you. I'm so glad I looked up at just that time. Was that you, Stefan? Yeah, that word prompt is such a great word. To prompt. See, here, God prompts. The, the word prompt retains and maintains agency. 
that, that God does not violate David. God does not violate Stephan. God does not violate Heather. God does not violate Mary. God retains the Davidness and the Stephanness and the Heatherness and the Maryness of our individual, but he tries to woo us away from perversity, away from blindness, away from lies, away from deception, to primarily himself. Because he is, what did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. God, the truth is not a concept or a construct. The truth is God. All truth is God's truth and all beauty is God's beauty. Okay, I want to read that next paragraph. When man has sinned against a holy and merciful God, he can pursue no course so noble as to repent sincerely and confess his errors and tears and bitterness of soul. Exactly. So you fall. So you so you gave in to the blindness of perversity. You made a mistake. You departed from the right way. You, you willingly or sometimes ignorantly imbibed lies. Okay, okay. And now you know it. Well, you can beat yourself up about it. You can... The thing to do is to repent, <laughs> is to confess and say, hey, God, I just made a giant mess here. I totally blew it. I did something, said something, thought something that I should not have done, said, or thought, or I didn't think, do, or say something that I should have think, done, or said. And in the very moment of the realization, when shame and guilt are at its highest, that is the moment of that it's so crucial that you repent and confess. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Because why? The hand that humbles is also the hand that exalts. The same hand that allows the guilt to come upon us is the same hand that frees us from that guilt when we turn to him and repent. This, this, all of this is so good. This God requires, this God requires of him. He accepts nothing less than a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Correct. Because sin is sin. Sin is terrible. But can't Jehoiakim and his lords, coming back now to Jehoiakim, in their arrogance and pride, refuse the invitation of God. They would not heed the waiting, the warning, and repent. The gracious opportunity proffered them at the time of the burning of the sacred scroll was their last. God had declared that if at that time they refused to hear his voice, he would inflict upon them fearful retribution. Okay, so all time. Three all times on this page. 416 is just out of this world. Go over to the next page, begins the burning of the roll. The burning of the roll was not the end of the matter. The written words were more easily disposed of than the reproof and warning they contained and the swift coming punishment God had pronounced against rebellious Israel. But even the written roll was reproduced. Take yet another scroll, the Lord commanded his servant, and write on it all the former words that were in the first scroll which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, has burned. The record of the prophecies concerning Judah and Jerusalem had been reduced to ashes. But the words were still living in the heart of Jeremiah like a burning fire. And the prophet was permitted to reproduce that which the wrath of man would fain have destroyed. Okay. I want to read one last paragraph here. Second to the last page, 418, 438 of the original. It was God's purpose. It was God's purpose. I love this. Because we get into those counterfactuals, right? This, this feature of Ellen White's writing, and I point it out almost every time we encounter it, what could have been, what should have been, what would have been, what might have been. And here's an example. It was God's purpose, okay, in writing, in giving the, the words to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah giving the words to Baruch, and Baruch writing it down, and giving the scroll to Jehoiakim and his advisors, and to all Judah, it was God's purpose that Jehoiakim should heed the counsels of Jeremiah and thus win favor in the eyes of Nebuchadnezzar and save himself much sorrow. That's what God's trying to do. Let's say it this way. What God is trying to do with Jehoiakim is save him from himself. That's what God's trying to do with you and I. God is trying to save us from, our, from ourselves, from the worst versions of ourselves. See, Jehoiakim, okay, check this out. Jehoiakim perceives that what Jeremiah is trying to do is undermine him, undermine his authority, undermine his, his, his person, undermine his reign. But what God is actually trying to do is save his butt. But what God's trying to do is even against the desire of the person he's trying to save, he's still trying to save him. So this is what God purposed the scroll would do. And thus, win favor in the eyes of Nebuchadnezzar and save himself much sorrow. Because Nebuchadnezzar, apparently God has so worked the behind the scenes mechanics of this, that if Judah will humble themselves and be a vassal of Nebuchadnezzar, 
that the temple need not be destroyed and Jerusalem need not be reduced to rubble and thousands of captives need not be carried away. So again, God's trying to save Jehoiakim from Jehoiakim and from his stupid decisions, just like God is trying to save David from David and David's stupid decisions. Keep reading here. The youthful king had sworn allegiance to the Babylonian ruler, and had he remained true to this promise, he would have commanded the respect of the heathen, and this would have led to precious opportunities for the conversion of souls. Here again, God is still on that plan A, the annexation of surrounding nations for the purpose that all families will be blessed, the Abrahamic covenant. God is still singing that same song, right? God still sees this evangelistic potential. Even at this late, late, late hour, 1159, God's vision is like, well, may, maybe if we do that, and then, and then we can still work and we can grow. and we, Because it's exposure, right? Just like Nineveh had to go to, or excuse me, uh, not Nineveh go, went, Jonah went to Nineveh to give exposure. And that exposure ultimately worked. And amazingly, we're going to find out that Nebuchadnezzar's heart is actually open to Yahweh. That's one of the incredible things in the book of Daniel is that Nebuchadnezzar actually becomes at some level a follower of and believer in Yahweh. So, so, so God knows what's in Nebuchadnezzar's heart. In fact, in one of the prophecies of Daniel, Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, God has given you this prophecy to show you the desires of your heart. So just like God had an interest in the pharaohs of old, God has an interest in Nebuchadnezzar too. And God sees, if I could just get Jehoiakim to get out of his own way, there is a softness in Nebuchadnezzar, even though he's a terrible, terrifying Babylonian marauder. I can work here. Let me work. Let me do what I can do. But Jehoiakim is not having it. Takes the letter, throws it, and then so God's now, instead of plan X, now we're on plan Y. Okay, and if plan Y doesn't work, then we're on Z. You see how that works? Okay, this was a great chapter. I, I enjoyed the chapter, not in the sense that you enjoy the, the, the ideas here are really sad and they're discouraging and they're disheartening. And if they're discouraging and disheartening for us, what were they for Jeremiah, the weeping prophet? But you can just see, can't you just see in your mind's eye, Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, just telling the truth, place to place, town to town, family to family, village to village, just traveling around, refusing to, to capitulate to the threats and the hatred of those in Judah that were denialists. He's like, no, I'm committed. I'm going to do what Yahweh told me to do. I'm sold out. And that's what this chapter is about, the approaching doom. I thought it was a great chapter. Let's get to the rubric and then our word. Okay, uh, the point, the person, the prayer, the practice, and the promise, the point to continue to tell of Jeremiah's ministry and messages in the closing years of Judah's independence, okay? And even at this point, they've kind of lost their full independence because as the chapter opens, they're vassals of Babylon, okay? But still, it's, a, it's picking up from our last chapter titled Jeremiah to continue to tell of the ministry, the message, right, of Jeremiah. The person, what do we learn about, you know what I wrote? I wrote down exactly that thing on page 416, one of my all-time quotes. Here it is. God pities men and women struggling in the blindness of perversity. That's what we learn about God. God's posture toward people that are behaving like complete morons that refuse to hear the truth and won't get out of their own way. Okay, and I'm describing myself here. Okay, I'm, I'm not pointing the finger. As the old saying goes, when you point the finger at someone, there's three fingers pointing back at you, right? So what I'm saying is, is that I need to remind myself that in my willful blindness and in my foolishness and in my falling and in my sins and in my mistakes, sometimes willful, sometimes out of ignorance or, or haste, that God's posture toward me is that he pities me. He has mercy. He looks down upon me with, with tender love in his heart because he sees that I'm caught up in the blindness of perversity. God wants what's best for me. Even if you're as far gone as Jehoiakim was, God is just trying to get you out of your own way and get you back on that path of truth and of righteousness. The Lord, our righteousness, to quote from Jeremiah 23. Okay, the prayer. I said, God, may your words and your wonderful, beautiful truth burn in my heart like they did in Jeremiah's of old. I just love that passage there in Jeremiah 20, that, that your, your word was like, a, was like a burning fire in my bones. 
and I, I couldn't even resist it. I want that. I want the gospel to be so burning in me. The truth of scripture to be so burning in me that I just can't, it just comes out of me. I think it is that way, but I want it to be even more effervescent. I just want it to just blah, 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 just bubble out of me. And not just out of my mouth, but out of my hands and my arms and my strength and my legacy and my family and my children. I just want that to be who I am in the world. I, I just want it to be like a fire in me, something that can't be quenched. Practice. Okay, there was a lot of things you could have put here, like, <laughs> I know I won't say that, I don't want to get in trouble. There's a lot of things you can say here, but the thing I want to say is, what I wrote down was to listen to and learn from God's prophets. I know that's kind of a low-hanging fruit. It's a little easy, but that's I, I just think we just need to be familiarizing ourselves with Scripture, reading it, rereading it. It's one of the reasons I love the With DA series. Whether it's DA with DA, OT with DA, SC with DA, I love that we're just in the Word. We're learning, we're listening, we're growing. We're learning, we're listening, we're growing, we're sharing. We're learning, we're listening, we're growing, we're sharing. We're learning, we're listening, we're growing, we're sharing. And I love the with DAs. I've gotten so many. I mean, at this point, it would be thousands of, you know, positive testimonies and feedback. More than a thousand, I should say. But this is this is just something that we are doing as a community. And praise God for the with DA community and the Light Bearers community. But this is something that we need to all be doing all the time. In some way, shape, or form. We just need to be listening to and learning from the prophets, listening to and learning from the truth. We need to learn. We just need to have the truth and a love for the truth so riveted to us that we're like those Rechabites. When somebody presents deception to us or falsehood to us, falsehood to us, or some wayward path to us, we say, no, no. Not because we're, you know, the descendants of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, but because we're descendants of Jesus, the son of God. And we're Christians. We bear his name. Just like the Rechabites bore the name of their ancestor, we bear the name of Jesus. That's what it means to be a Christian, Christ follower. We just say, no, I don't, I don't do that. Now, sometimes I do because I fall and I make a mistake and I fail, but that's not how I live my life. There's a big difference here, and I want to just dwell on that for a moment. There's a big difference between occasionally doing something, falling, failing, making a mistake, and how you live your life. Okay, so... so Take the, the the example of the Rechabites. They lived their life in this particular by saying, we're, we're going to insulate ourselves from drunkenness, inebriation, addiction. We don't do this. It doesn't mean that no Rechabite ever didn't maybe under some circumstance, some situation, some folly, some rebellious teenager drink. But they're just saying, this isn't how we live our lives. Same with us. If you fail or you fall, you make a mistake, you gossip, you lust, you... You, you speak unwell of somebody, whatever. That might be a thing you did or occasionally a thing you do, certainly more often than you wish you did, but that's not how you live your life. It's not who you are. You're a follower of Jesus and you need to take on board and receive and believe that identity that who you are in Christ is the truest thing about you. Who you are in Christ is more true than who you are in Adam or in self or in sin. So cling to that truth, to that great recalibration and recentering of your identity. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And that means this is your identity. When you fall, it's a fall from your identity, from who you are. You don't become that person. No, no, because you get back up like the righteous man in Proverbs 24, 16. So, so don't identify. It's one of the mistakes that people make today. They identify with their sin and they so identify with their particular sins that this becomes kind of a part of oh, well, I'm stubborn. Okay, well, okay, you're stubborn. I'm angry. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a sexual addict. I'm a, you know, people say, hmm. I think there is a sense in which we can say I sinned but over-identifying with individual sins, I think, is ultimately not helpful. It's not helpful to you or to those around you because your identity is in Christ. That's who you are. You're a follower of the Messiah. Okay, finally, the promise. My, pro my promise is Jeremiah 23, 36. Speaking of identity, speaking of who we are, uh, she quotes it here in that section where she says that God would often show Jeremiah really great things 
to help him to cope with the really bad things. Let's read it again, Jeremiah 23. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness, like a vine. Jesus said, I am the vine. A king shall reign and prosper, capital K king, and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. And that's who Jesus is. He is our Lord and he is our righteousness. It is the robe of his perfect righteousness that we wear, not our own spotty righteousness. So the promise here is the Lord, our righteousness. And when he is our Lord, his righteousness is ours. That's how it works. So if you can say right now, say it out loud, Jesus is my Lord. Just say that out loud. Jesus, you are my Lord. Then his righteousness is yours. If you say that and you mean it, Jesus, you are my Lord. Do I always do it? The way I wish I did, do I always say the things I wish I said? Do I always think that? No, no, no. But Jesus, you're my Lord and I'm learning. And Jesus says, if I'm your Lord, then my righteousness is yours. It's the gospel. Okay, everybody, what is your word? What is your word? Uh, somebody's asking what the promise was. Jeremiah 23, 3 to 6. Jeremiah 23, 3 to 6. All right, I got a lot of people here saying, Jesus is my Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, everybody, um, let's do our word here. I'm going to be so curious to see if anybody has my word. Here we go. Judgments, obedience, opportunities, heed, prompt, great word. Another prompt. Father, Deb Snyder says instrument. That was almost my word. My other word was almost desolation or desolate. Pride, reproof. Tasman traders, oh, you're very close to where I'm at. Like, basically, we're thinking the same thing. Judgments, disobedient, messages, purpose. I purposely didn't say it out loud, Tasman traders, because I don't want to give it away yet. But if people were paying attention, they saw, okay, Dino Evans, there's my word, burning. That's my word. Oh, other people have it too. T.O. Han, burn. Yeah, my word is burning. We'll come back to that in a second. Commit, impenitent pronounced, illustrations, broken, heartened. Oh, great word. Conviction. Oh, Makushala says, I like, or Makushala says, I like the dual meaning. Yes, agree. Conviction. Um, Stefan says, warp. Oh, good word. Very good. Warp our senses and our sensibilities. Um, burning. Someone says, nice, mom. Okay, so somebody's mom must have had a really good word. <laughs> I love it. Um, 303 Syzygy says, every and hand. Oh, hand is a really great word. Stefan says, snare. Exodus Midwife says, robbed. Lenny9802 says, identity. Tanya says, warning. Great word, Tanya. Oh, Reiner or Alice says, woo. <laughs> Out to chat says, my word is Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty. Okay, I like it. I'll take it. Even though it's uh, it's two words. I like it. AKA Shaggy 99 says, allows. Oh, that's your second word. Wine says Stefan was another one he thought of. Yeah, that's good. Rich 77 AA says, nevertheless. I'm, I'm happy that a couple people had burned. Let me tell you why I had the word burned. Because burning occurs at three crucial junctures in this chapter, at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end. And basically what you have is at the beginning, you have a burning city. She literally says, I'll read it here. This is the second paragraph. Um, Jerusalem was to be laid waste and burned with fire. So you have a burning city. Then in the middle, you have the words of Yahweh burning in the prophet. Burning in the prophet. And then what happens when the burning words of the prophet, the burning words of Yahweh are presented to the king. The king literally burns the scroll. So we have to take our choice here. Do we want a burning city? Then burn the scroll. Or do we want to avoid the burning city? Then the words have to burn in our hearts, not burn in the fire and the flames as a way to ignore and try to reduce to ashes. In fact, I actually think that's the point that, that Ellen White is making when she gives this paragraph. Let me read you this paragraph again. Page 417, the record of the prophecies concerning Judah and Jerusalem had been reduced to ashes 
but the words were still living in the heart of Jeremiah like a burning fire, and the prophet was permitted to reproduce that which the wrath of man would fain have destroyed. She's clearly making the point. So burning city, burning prophet, burning words, burning scroll. So for me, I just, I loved that. I just thought, oh, that captures it. And it captures what I want my experience with this chapter to be. And that is that when God warns me about, I mean, this world is going to burn in the same way that Jerusalem was going to burn, that the temple was going to burn. This world is going to burn, right? Like, like God is going to return this world. All the things around us that we think are the most important things. And I'm talking about widgets and cars and skidoos and summer vacation homes and all the things that we think are the most important things. All that stuff's going to burn. And, and, and God is telling us, hey, these are not the most important things. The most important things are character and converts. That is to say, character and people that you persuade to depart from the blindness of perversity. That, that's, those are the things that matter. Those things are eternal. The Apostle Paul says, don't set your mind on the things that are temporal. Set your mind on the things that are eternal. And so... That's, that's what I love. I love this idea that we are being told and reminded over, over again in scripture that this world is going to burn. So what should we do? What should our response to that warning be? God, may your words burn in my heart. And when your scroll, huh? here we go, when your scroll says things that I don't like or that cross my grain, May I let these words burn into my heart rather than, you know, discarding it saying, oh, I'm going to get rid of that. I'm getting rid of that. I don't want that anymore in my life. That's what some people do. They don't want to have anything to do with the scroll. And so they burn it. Whether or not they literally burn it is beside the point, but they effectively burn it just like Jehoiakim. Get, get that out of my sight. I don't want to hear that anymore. Even after they've only heard a small bit. No, no, no. What we want is we want the word to burn into our heart. Amen. All right, everybody, that was a great lesson. We're back tomorrow for chapter 36. Remember, just three more chapters, and then we are out of this section. Uh, tomorrow's the last king of Judah. Last king of Judah, chapter 36. We'll be almost certainly at the same time tomorrow. I don't think there's any reason we have to go later tomorrow. So 7 o'clock tomorrow, probably sign on a little bit early just to greet Instagram and say hi and do all of that. Let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, we want your word to burn in our hearts. And Father, to burn up the dross, to burn up the deception, the self-deception, the self-complacency that Ellen White talks about in this chapter. Father, burn away all of the dross that what remains is good and beautiful and true and godly. Father, we do know that like Jerusalem of old and like the temple of old, this world is going to burn. But Father, we don't want to burn up with it. We want your words to burn in our hearts, to be indelibly in our minds, in our souls, in our families, in our communities. And Father, don't let us die in isolation, but help us to create these accountability structures and safety nets around us so that we can go together, not as individuals or in isolation, but as a, as a group. We can march to Zion. As the old song says, when the, when the saints go marching in, I want to be in that number. Not just me alone in isolation, but I want to go with people that, are, that love you, those that look to you, those that say, this is our God, we have waited for him and he will save us. Father, we want to be those people. We want to be Jeremiah, like Jeremiah. And we can't wait to meet him one day in the not too distant future, in the new heaven, in the new earth. Father, keep us faithful until that day is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.